Hey everyone, this is uh, Sapelo 2021 edition. I am here, I'm Claudio Gratton with... Olaf Jensen, back after uh, 15 years of not being here in Sapelo. The oh. last time I was here was as a student. So uh, it's fun to be here on the other side. And it was my first class teaching, so this is extra special. That's right. So glad to have you back. And of course, the venerable... Emily Stanley, this is my... Gosh, I don't even know. I want to oh. say 20th... A 20 year period of doing yeah. Sapelo every other year. That's fantastic. This is a class that's been going on since the 70s. Um, used to be called, or still is called, uh, Problems in Oceanography. But the reality is we spend most of the time in habitats that look like what's behind us here. Uh, the coastal salt marshes of uh, Georgia, Sapelo Island has an amazing uh, infrastructure. The University of Georgia Marine Institute uh, is here. And we spend uh, a week, 10 days uh, with the students uh, learning more about these uh, incredible coastal ecosystems and the students carry out projects uh, while they're here. So we've been coming back for a few years. Um, Emily, what have you seen that's most different this year that's uh, surprised you? Well, what surprised me the most, I think, is probably the beach, which has been really flattened out and seems to be lacking hermit crabs and some of the typical morphology that we see on the beach. Uh, I think apparently that is a remnant of some prior hurricanes that came through, but wow, this difference is really striking. Yeah, yeah, the beach is huge, it's really wide, yeah. and uh, some of the, the, the topography on the actual beach is yeah. kind of flattened out, uh, the dunes are really far back, it's, it's really pretty st striking, yeah. I think it was interesting what you were saying about how um, some of even the dominant species uh, one year can be entirely absent the next. Yeah. I mean, we saw fiddler crabs all over the marsh this time. Yeah, and not said, at all on the beach. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, they're usually abundant, and the little the little gods are usually super abundant. But yeah, we, we've been here in some years where you walk through the tall form Spartina and the plant hoppers, the Procles and plant hoppers, just go flying off. It's like a cloud of them. And this year, it was hard to actually see any of them, it, which is amazing. Because and Claudio cried yeah, a little bit. I, I, think. I did a few tears. Um, yeah, but, uh, but the students, as usual, are super industrious. They've come up with really creative projects, building on pro past projects, and we also have new projects, including looking at distribution of crabs, uh, including, um, what other projects do we have? Oh, that are... mi microplastics, trying to see how the, the marsh uh, is either a source or sink for microplastics. And some yeah. follow-up behaviors on iron root plaques in Spartina, or uh, crab behavior, uh, things like that. Some of the ones building up of past projects help us build time series that are pretty interesting. Yeah. Some classics like uh, spatial distribution of rib muscle in the marsh, uh, yeah. looking at clumping versus uh, over dispersion. Yeah. yeah, so many neat things to look at. It seems like uh, we never run out of ideas, which is, uh, which is really cool. So it's been great. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, get introduced a little bit to the students and the projects that they've been working on. My name is David Ortiz. I'm a graduate student at the CFL. And for my SAPO project, I decided to focus on the Atlantic sand fiddler crab. I'm interested in these crabs because of their extreme di display of sexual dimor dimorphism. More specifically, I'm interested in how it affects their daily lives, as it does account for up to 40% of their total body mass. More specifically, I'm interested in how this extra mass affects their running velocities. There are huge swarms of these crabs out on the salt pans of um, Dean Creek Marsh, and it's easy to imagine that the slow crabs are picked off first. So, to test my hypothesis that male crabs run slower than females, I ran several time trials to see if there was any differences. In addition to that, I also tested other variables that might lead to any differences. So those differences include size, leg length, and even personality. To test for personality, I um, had several buckets filled with sand with a pseudo burrow, and then I scared them into the hole, and I waited to see how long it would take for them to come out of the hole. I am done with some boldness trials and running trials, so now I'm freezing the males. Sure, what's, what's in these little mud buckets? What's this all about? Each individual container. Each individual container contains a, a crab that I've been keeping track of for the past week with time trials and behavior assays. And uh, what's the behavior that you're looking at? Uh, boldness. So I'm boldness, saying, what does that mean? 
I'm seeing, I'm testing to see how willing they are to come out of the burrow after I scare them and how quickly they do that. All right. My name is Adam and I'm studying the distribution of stem boring insects in Spartina. I'm looking for differences between the abundance and the species uh, composition between the low, middle, and high marsh, uh, as well as looking for patterns on the vertical distribution of different insect species within a single uh, Spartina stem. I'm cutting open uh, Spartina stems looking for stem boring insects. Take a bag here, that one's bad. Take this out. Hi, my name is Adriana Gorski, and for my Sapelo project, I investigated temperature here on Dean Creek Marsh, which you see behind me. Salt marshes are highly dynamic systems. They exist in this inner tidal zone, so they're influenced by extreme changes in tidal inundation throughout the day. So what I did was an extension off of um, a previous Sapelo project. In 2018, Holly Emke developed this tool called the TORCH, which stands for Thermal Observational Recordings Across Changing Habitats. And what's unique about this piece of equipment um, is that we're able to look at temperature from a very fine scale. So normally, historically, temperature has been studied based off point measurements of a stationary sensor. But with this tool, we're able to look at the spatial heterogeneity of temperature across a marsh which exists with varying gradients. So we have a hobo temperature and light logger at three different heights that match the heights of the gradients we see on a marsh. Because of these gradients across low and high Spartina, I predicted that thermal variation will be greatest during the exposed low tide and heterogeneity will increase with distance from the creek. My advice for future students at Sapelo is to really explore the island in the habitats that exist there. Make sure you go see a sunrise and the sunset and take advantage of every free moment you have. And if you do plan to do a project on Dean Creek Marsh, make sure you watch where you step. Um, this photo right here is me knee deep in the marsh with a smile on my face though, don't worry. So do pick a, a project on Dean Creek. <laughs> Hi, right, my name is Kristen Kibler. I went over here onto Sapelo Island, Georgia. That's yeah. And basically, we study the saltwater marsh, study the recovery and resilience of Spartina diebacks, focusing on the storage of their organic carbon within their soils. It's a great time. You're gonna get stuck, but it's the best time of my life. All right, let's go. I'm examining herbivory across a coastal sand dune gradient, which is a classic example for the stress gradient hypothesis. So that states that as abiotic stress increases, mutualistic interactions or beneficial interactions increase as well. And so as you move from the fore dune where there's highest abiotic stress driven by salinity and wind and constant burial, it decreases as you go towards the forest where you have denser plant populations. So I suspect that herbivory would be following inversely with that gradient of abiotic stress. So you'd have the most insect herbivory near the back dune. And so I looked across transects across this gradient going up along Nanny Goat Beach, um, characterizing the plant community and the percent cover of each of those species in 0.5 times 0.5 meter plots. Um, and then I also looked at chlorophyll and herbivory of those populations. I also characterized one focal plant on five different transects to see how these different zones across the gradient would change um, in content of herbivory looking at this one plant. So hopefully I'll find cool things. This is a mangrove tree crab. 
They live in mangrove trees from Brazil to Florida, and nobody knows how they got to Sapo Island or what they're doing here. Sid, what are you up to here? You can't disturb the crabs. <laughs> My name's Sydney, and I wanted to learn how widespread mangrove tree crabs are on Sapelo, what types of habitats support them, and what role they're playing on the island. I'm here at Barn Creek by the post office, which is behind me. There's some marsh back there, some dock structure, some trees over here, lots of different types of crab habitat to check out. A lot of times, mangrove tree crabs like to hang out underneath docks. The shelter offered by built structures might be one of the reasons these crabs are able to survive so far north. I've also found um, <laughs> exactly one mangrove tree crab in a tree along the shore. If you stand very quietly, you can hear them walking around in the trees. Here's my catch after two hours. Normally, I find a lot of these really tiny mangrove tree crabs, but today I've been consistently finding ones that are more this size. Oh. All right, we'll get it. Hold on. Oh, look how cute he is or she. This project was a really cool chance to observe the dynamics of a rain shift happening in real time. I hope future saploids continue to keep a watchful eye out for these crabs and send them my best wishes on their journey north. I'm getting the XY position of each rib muscle and whether they're alive or dead to do a point process analysis and determine the clustering or dispersion of the muscles at different spatial scales. Hi Mary. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I have seen these little uh, crossword-like puzzle uh, sheets that you have. What's going on there? I am measuring or looking at the spatial distribution of the muscles. And so what, what are these little dots here? Um, the dots are the locations of the muscles. Oh, in the and how big are those dots in the real world? Um, like up to four inches, technically. Well, the, each grid is half an inch. Oh. I hypothesize that there will be more muscles and more clustering the closer to the creek the plot is and more clustering among dead muscles than alive muscles. Hi, I'm Danny. And I'm Nick. And we're here at Sapelo. We're studying microplastic flux. Um, so what we're using here is a mantatrol that's capturing the flow of microplastics uh, into and out of the marsh. We hypothesize that the flow of plastics into the marsh is gonna be greater than the flow out because the marsh is so pristine. Uh, and hopefully we're gonna be able to then determine the source of plastics in this ecosystem. Is it from the marsh or is it from the ocean? Hi, I'm Ariel Link. I'm a first year PhD student in the Integrated Biology Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm currently in Dean Creek Marsh on the beautiful Sapelo Island, Georgia. I spent the week digging up Spartina alterniflora plants in the low, middle, and high marsh zones of the creek and looking at their roots under the microscope. I was looking for either iron sulfide or iron oxide root plaques, or if there were no root plaques pl present at all. Um, and I am asking if distance from the creek or plant size and characteristics affects the types of plaques that are present on the plants. Hey 
everyone, my name is Jess Briggs and I am a first year graduate student in Grace Wilkinson's lab. My Sapelo project was investigating the trends in soil organic matter here on Nanny Goat Beach. My project was looking at how organic matter content changed from down by the shoreline up into these mid dune areas, as well as down within the soil column um, at 10 centimeters versus a one centimeter top sample. What y'all are seeing right now is Nanny Goat Beach at high tide. At low tide, that water line is about 75 meters further back away from the dune, um, which means things are constantly changing here at the beach. So my sample sites were looking at the furthest back from the dune into the meadow areas on top of this dune right here, and then every 25 meters until we reached the water line. Um, three samples were taken at low tide and two were taken at high tide. Um, so at high tide, I was only able to get in three of my six sample sites. So in total, I had 18 sampling sites and at each site, I took a soil core and collected 1.5 milliliters of soil from the surface and then again at 10 centimeters deep. Um, that was then taken back to the lab to be processed for organic matter um, by doing a loss on ignition protocol, um, lots and lots of weighing. And then there's also some samples coming back to Madison with me to look at chlorophyll A concentrations, which should give some insight into any diatom communities that are living in the soil that could cause organic matter to change. Overall, this place is absolutely incredible. Savor all of your time here. It will go by so quickly. And don't be afraid to do a beach project. They are really awesome. So it's been a great week here at Sapelo. The, uh, the students have experienced uh, problems in oceanography, more, more <laughs> problems in oceanography. Um, but that's part of the course is problem solving. And they've certainly done that. Yeah, adapting uh, to the conditions that are thrown at you. Equipment fails, equipment is missing. Missing um, crabs. Missing crabs. <laughs> all kinds of things. But all in all, I'm always so impressed with uh, the, the work that they do, late night hours, and uh, you know all the neat things that they're learning. Uh, doing. And, and good fun and bonding as well. Right. Right? Sunrise and sunset on the beach. Yeah, we had a, with a little science. We had a full moon, super high tides, and Unbelievably, this is, I think, the first time where we've not had any rain at all oh, on the yeah, It's so been lovely. It's been, uh, it's been pretty amazing. All right, until next time, see y'all.